had a, the, the Press Democrat was blessed with a lot of wonderful, wonderful journalists who found that this, this place fit for them, you know, that uh, rather than perhaps at one time they thought maybe they'd like to go on to a bigger paper, get on with the Chronicle or, or aspire to the, the Washington Post or something, or the New York Times, but instead, you know, these folks and, and myself included came to Santa Rosa, California, went to work for the Press Democrat, fell in love with this place and felt like this, this place fits. And for years and years, nobody left the Press Democrat. For many, many years, uh, pretty much if you were a reporter, a photographer, an editor for the Press Democrat, <clears throat> you, um, you stayed. So I, when I walked in, I was 23 years old, very much the baby of the, of the news staff. And then when I walked out, last, uh, the last day of April of last year, I was very much the, um, the, the, the old seasoned veteran of the place. Pretty interesting, we were all, we were all uh, of, a, of a certain age and we know what that's like. And one day you're the kid, and the next thing, what do you know, you're the old man of the staff. How did that happen? But I felt very, very fortunate to work virtually my entire career at the, at the Press Democrat. And what I'm doing now is they, they call me when somebody notable dies. And I'm, I'm glad they call me because uh, you may have seen in the paper today I had the obituary for Len Tillen. Why are you calling a lawyer? And you know the, the Press Democrat could assign any number, any one of a number of young reporters to go figure out who Len Tillum was, but most certainly that reporter had never heard of Len Tillum. You know, most of the, the the staffers of the Press Democrat now would never have heard of Len Tillum or not have any idea who he was or what he did. And so, <coughs> excuse me, what an advantage for to ask me to do it because I knew him, I listened to him. I had an idea what he was about, and so it's not a cold start for me to write his obituary. Um, I've done about uh, six or seven obits, and then at the end of the last year, I wrote, uh, I think, about, about 20 people who had died in, in 2021. I wrote about uh, uh, some of the notable people, Don Green and Norma um, uh, Brown, and, on and on, and I, nearly all of them uh, I knew. So things change, and I'm an optimist. I trust that things, that life will go on. Obviously, things change. And pretty soon, the day will come at the Press Democrat that someone will pass away, someone uh, the prestige of a, of a, um, a Cotting or a Schultz or a Trioni, or, or we hope not even uh, even a Traverso, although it won't, it won't be anytime soon. <laughs> and the thing is that there will, the, the day is coming when not a single staffer at the Press Democrat will have any idea who any of those people was. None. And so this is a this is a sea change because you know from the time that I walked in to that newspaper. <coughs> In 1977, you know, there were these reporters who'd been around, reporters and editors been around forever. Kathy Barnett, the retired editor, was born in this town, you know. And so for years and years and years, there were people in that newsroom who lived here and, and grown up here or spent their lives here and knew people. And now the Press Democrat has a whole new crew of young people. And, and pretty soon, uh, none of them will have any idea who anybody is. And it, it's tougher. And then we've been talking a little bit about the newspapers. And I'll say the one, one, one good thing you can say about the Press Democrat is that it is faring better than most. It's faring better than most because we do not have debt. The newspaper does not have debt. It does not have sh stockholders. Uh, share, it doesn't have, it doesn't have to generate uh, but it does have to generate, it attempts to generate a profit, but at least we don't have stockholders. Um, but the Press Democrat s struggles some itself. And you may have seen also in the newspaper today, 
a very sad day for the, the, the press Democrat, and that is that they are giving up, they're gonna close later this spring, they're gonna close the printing facility there along Highway 101 in Warner Park. They're gonna shut it down, and they're gonna pay the Chronicle to print the press Democrat over in Fremont. And it's a, it just is a sad day. You know, here the press Democrat is for something like 160 years has been this self-contained, um, typically fairly thriving regional newspaper with our own printing press and our own everything. And so it's a, it is a sad day, there's no way around it. That's a sad day for them to, to close their printing press and to um, fire, lay off these craftsmen uh, who, who, who run that press. But we hope life goes on. So in, the, in my years here, um, I was at the paper about 42 years. I did have some big stories, but I, over time, I found that I enjoy the little stories. And so the last 20 years of my career, I was fortunate to succeed Gay LeBaron and write an item column. And uh, I, I am no Gay LeBaron and I am no Herb King, but I was inspired by both of them. And I think it, it, we can all remember them uh, for all, all the decades, the many decades, that Guy LeBaron and Herb Cain, you would find them on page two of their respective newspaper. The Chronicle, the Press Democrat, you open it up, and there's that <clears throat> wide column, and all the way from the top to the bottom of that page. And Herb Cain had these wonderful, maybe 30 little items, this three-dot journalism, and got all these people's names in the paper, and all this funny stuff, sad stuff, you know, commentary on the news, all. and people just ate it up. And the Gayla Baron had her column all the way down page two. And so when I got the column uh, upon Gay's retirement in 2002, I started writing these little stories. And it would make my day, it, it truly, like I would rather have a bunch of little stories about Sonoma County and about the people of Sonoma County than have a big story. And so like what made my day was say like the day that I spoke with attorney and former um, Sonoma County supervisor, Eric Koenigshofer. We all know Eric Koenigshofer, or you know of him. Eric Koenigshofer, still around. So Eric recalls to me one day that he had a big case working opposite a woman attorney, I believe in Sacramento. And one day, the case was going to be finalized and it was going to require them to both sign off on the papers. It was a big deal, big day for this case. And he was to call this lawyer in Sacramento and let her know the papers were ready. And so it, it, it was a, a big phone call. So Eric, he finally gets the papers and he's going to notify his opposing counsel in Sacramento, and he calls her up. And he asks for the attorney, can I speak with so-and-so? And, -so? and the, the woman who answered the phone said, well, she's in a meeting. And Eric said, well, I'm sure she would want to be gotten out of that meeting. This is important, so I'm sure she would want you to go get her out of that meeting. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try, I'll ask him, I'll ask her. And she says, and tell me your name. This is Eric Koenigshoff. Oh! She goes, oh, well, yes, um, I'll be right back to you. And Eric has no idea why this woman on the other phone, this legal assistant, perked up at the sound of his name, but he liked it. And uh, he waits, and then a few moments later, the, the attorney comes on and says, hello, who is this? Mm. Who is this? And he says, he tells her this. This is Eric Koenigshofer. She says, oh, God. She says, my assistant just ran into the meeting and said that I had a phone call from Harry Connick's chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Connick's chauffeur. <coughs> I also, I, I wrote recently, well, one of the obituaries that I did lately was for... Um, the fellow who, for Tim Alexander, who had Tate's Shoe Repair, Shoe Service in downtown San Rosa. I trust we were all one time or another. Tate's 
shoe service. And I went in there. And I can tell you that years ago, I would see him. I don't even think I knew his name. But I, I was in to, for shoe repair and for laces and whatnot. I mean, he was right across from the press Democrat. And one day I said to him, hey, I need to write about you and this, this shop, this chaotic, old school shoe store. Good luck finding anything, you know. And now I understand quite charismatic, uh, quite typically of him, he was not interested in publicity. He said he was not interested in having me write a story about it. Okay, I did. But I, but I wrote his obituary. And Gay told me that she's, if Gay wrote about him, I missed it, but I think it may still be coming. That Gay told me that she was gonna write a story about Tate's shoe service now that he has passed. And what it was is it involves Benny Friedman. Benny Friedman, Benny Friedman was truly one of the funniest people. He, he could have been a professional comic. And Benny Friedman told Gay one time that when he went off to war, both he and his brother Joe went off to World War II, came back, and that's when they started this little kind of a junkyard in Petaluma that became Friedman's home improvement. So Benny tells Gay, yeah, I went off to war. I was gone whatever it was, two or three years. I come, I come back and I find, I remember, I find this tag, oh my God, I, before I went off to war, I'd taken a pair of shoes into Tate's. <laughs> and uh, he goes in and he says, I went in there and I said, hey, I'm sorry, I, I, I brought you a pair of shoes for repair before the war, I'm so sorry to be coming back now. And, and he says, the guy looks at his number and he looks at the shelves and he says, you know, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to come back next week for those. <laughs> 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 Gay, Gay and I both re loved writing stories of Ben Friedman. And one of the, the favorites was that when he said, when he and Joe started Friedman's down in Petaluma, because they didn't want to compete with a friend who'd been good to them up here in Santa Rosa. Uh, Benny Friedman, his line was, he says that uh, first day of business, Joe and I, we made 75 cents. He says the second day, business fell off. <laughs> he says the third day, a guy came in and asked if we could break a 20. We made him a partner. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that, to me, it's priceless to have in your hometown newspaper. You're getting people's names in the paper in a positive way. It's, it's not because they were hit on the head or they're protesting the homeless shelter or whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's human around the, the, the pickle barrel kind of stories. Uh, and you know, I've, I've written about some people who came from Santa Rosa and, and, or Sonoma County and, and went away and, and became famous. And then if I would write something in Orgay, they would say, you know, they get a lot of publicity, they you know, maybe been on national news, but there's something about getting your name in your hometown newspaper. Something about getting your name in your, in your hometown newspaper. You know, I, um, one of my fascinations is people who are 110 years old and over, called super centenarians. And you know, there was time at, at, the, at the Press Democrat and probably your paper that if somebody turned 100 years old, you probably did something on them. If they turned 100 years old, you probably did something on them. For better or for worse, I swear now that over a number of years, I've talked to a number of people 110 or close to it, that if somebody calls me up and says, hey, my aunt out in Oakmont is gonna turn 100 years old next Tuesday, could you come out and write something? I, I'm really tempted to say, you know, could you have her call me in 10 years? <laughs> I mean, it, I wouldn't actually say that, but 100 isn't all that uncommon anymore, right? But 110. So the other day, I was somewhere and my phone rang, I couldn't pick it up. And I saw that it's a woman calling me 
from Willits, and I knew who she is, and I suspected I knew why she was calling. The last two years, in 2019 and 2020, I went up to Willits for a birthday party. And it's for a woman named Edith Edie Ciccarelli. Good Swedish name. <laughs> Ciccarelli. Well, I was, when I saw that it was, this niece of hers was calling, I'm thinking, uh-oh. I, 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 I assume that I know what has happened to Edith Ciccarelli since I was at her birthday party last year. But I called, no. She's doing quite well. Edie is doing quite well. We're going to have another party. It's going to be a drive-by like last year's was for Willits native Edith Ciccarelli on February 5th when she turns 114 years old. And that's it. It is like, Jesus. Um, you think, 114, she was born in 1908. Imagine what, she, and she was born in Willits. And she came, she and her uh, first husband, Elmer Brick Keenan, was a typesetter at the Press Democrat, another, another craft that has gone away, but he was a typesetter at the Press Democrat. So they lived, the two of them, in Santa Rosa for a number of years, moved back to Willits. And of course, he passed away eons ago. And I sat next to her at her hundred for her hundred and twelfth party. They actually that was nine, that was 2019 before COVID. So there was actually a party. I sat next to her for a while. And she she was speaking to me. She she was that present. Now I understand that dementia has kind of caught up with her now. But I talked with the um, one of her caregivers, and she said um, that her that Evie, Evie's advice was, you know, obviously when you're 114 years old, you're 110 people, everybody wants to know what's your secret, what's your secret. And she said her advice was, have two fingers of red wine and mind your own business. <laughs> that, was, that was her advice for a long life. And <laughs> two fingers of wine, mind your own business. Yeah, two fingers, yeah. So um, the person who keeps it, she lives in a small home. It's just a house in a neighborhood in Willits, but it's a care home, you know, it's a professional care home, so there's only two or three tenants, residents. And she told the woman who has says, yeah, she does have a sip of wine with dinner. Evie, Evie does. And sometimes before she goes to bed, she'd like a, um, a little ice cream. And sometimes she liked a little wine with the ice cream. So, fine. She says, sometimes she'd like a little wine with breakfast. <laughs> What's it gonna hurt? Um, so, I do plan to be at E.B. Ch Ciccarelli's 114th birthday. And I'm dealing with, an, uh, there's a wonderful organization, I believe it's out of USC, it might be UCLA, <clears throat> called the Gerontology Research Group. And when they hear about somebody like her anywhere in the world, they go and they try to document that the person is as old as he or she says. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, they're, they're scientists, so they don't just, you know, take your word for it. They want to, if there's documents, they want to see them. And if they are satisfied, then they will document and they put them on the list. And you can look up that list at Gerontology Research, whatever I said. And according to their list, our E.B. Ciccarelli is the, I wanna make sure I get this right. I believe she is, yes, the 14th oldest person on earth. Oh my God. Oh my God. 14th oldest person on earth. So I'm looking forward to writing about her. Um, 
The oldest person, you're probably wondering, is Kane Tanaka of Japan. 119 years, 18 days. 119 years. And this is wonderful, you know, that at 119 years, you figure she could very well have a child who's 110 years, or 100 years old. You know, she could have a grandchild who's 80 years old, right? 119. Of the 17th, there were 17 names that I saw this morning when I checked. Of the 17, Kane and five others on the list are Japanese. Evie and five others are American. None are male. But you know, you know what? Oddly enough, there are not many from Scandinavia. Yeah, um, I remember. Anyway, I remember Brazil and here and there, but I I would have thought Scandinavia. So we shouldn't make any plans for 119th birthday? Well, I would say don't bother because I'm not going to be here to write about it. But that's one of my fascinations. Um, I can tell you that just recently I had lunch for, with a woman who's, whose name is Alice Darrow. Now, one thing that's amazing about Alice Darrow, she used to live for many years in the Kelsey Village. She moved not too long ago down to the East Bay. Now she's gonna be 102. Well, and, and she could sit here right to and just, she could, sit, she could be talking to you right now. I wish she were. If she were here, there'd probably be more people came. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> probably. Um, one of my joys, uh, one of the many joys that I had as a press Democrat and again, it took 40 years, it required that I be there 40 years, was that I met a number of years ago some of our Pearl Harbor survivors. Now, not that many years ago, let's say 1991, that's when I started talking to Pearl Harbor survivors. In 1991, that was 50 years out from Pearl Harbor, right? 41 to 91. And I met our local Pearl Harbor survivors. I interviewed a number of them wrote about them. Gay, of course, has done a lot with Pearl Harbor survivors, but they made me a, a, a honorary member, an honorary Pearl Harbor survivor. And I love these guys, and I went, I went to them, I went with them to Pearl Harbor twice for the, for the 50th and the 60th. And they were just, to hear their stories about where they were on that day, I mean, and it, you know, I, I learned so much. For one thing, you know, I grew up with, with John Wayne and Vic Morrow and that kind of thing, you know, Clint Eastwood. We all did. And so I will admit that I had an idea that, that soldiers and sailors and fighting men were these tough, macho, um, patriotic killers. <laughs> I mean, and I mean that in a, in a positive way, but they were, you know, tough guys. Well, you get to talk, you, you've, it dawns on you as you're starting to write about Pearl Harbor survivors that they were they did not join because of their war. They joined before the war. So that obviously, if they were at Pearl Harbor in uniform, they joined the Navy or, or the other services in 1940, 1941. They were already in. Why were they there? Because they were tough guys and they wanted to shoot people? No. They were in because they were 17 years old, the economy sucked, and they wanted a job. And they were really just kids. And to think, you know, talk about these guys, realize they were 18 years old and they were at Pearl Harbor on that day and what they beheld and what, what they saw. Well, Alice Darrow, one of my favorite people in the world, she was a nurse. She was a Navy nurse over here at Bear Island. And she was there when there was this buzz in the hospital. There was a young sailor there from Pearl Harbor. His name was Dean Darrow. And he'd been, he'd been aboard the West Virginia. And it was, uh, he was blown off the deck, as so many were, with the strike of a torpedo. He's in the water, the oily water, <clears throat> being strafed. And he was injured, he was hit, he was taken, 
I believe he was taken to the hospital Chip Solis. They saw there was a wound to his back. They patched him up. They, they um, x-rayed him. I guess they did have x-rays in 1941. And eventually, they sent him back to do uh, the wound was healing. He went back. So now he's on a destroyer because, of course, the West Virginia wasn't going anywhere. And as he's out there, now the war is on, and he'd run to battle stations and whatnot, he'd be uh, breathless and tired. What's wrong with me? And I can just imagine if a movie were made, he might tell the chief, hey, chief, I just don't feel good. I really feel rotten. And I can imagine as the old grizzly chief saying, there's a war on, kid, you know, get, get a grip. Well, one day, Dean Darrow, young sailor Dean Darrow, could not get out of bed, could not get out of his bunk. Uh, they figured, well, there is something wrong with this kid. They sent him back to Pearl Harbor, and he un had new x-rays taken, and they found something. And what they found, in the back of his heart, in the muscle of his heart, they found a 7.7 .7 millimeter Japanese bullet. It had gone through his lungs, seared it shut, the, lung, the, the damage to the hole in the lung, and it came to rest in the muscle of his heart. So they send him to Mare Island, where he meets his, his nurse, Alice Becker. Everybody calls her Becky. And one day, Darrow, Dean Darrow, before the um, surgery, says, Becky, Miss Becky, if I come out, if I come through this, would you take liberty with me? And you know, she's trying to keep his spirits up. So she says, well, yes, of course I would, like you're gonna come out of this, you know, <laughs> open heart surgery in the spring of 1942. So they pulled that, the, a doctor from Stanford pulled that bullet out of him. And when Dean Darrow came about, the, uh, the officer, the surgeon, shows him. He says, if you don't mind, sailor, I'd like to keep this. Dean Darrow said, I'm sorry, sir. I'll be keeping that. <laughs> <laughs> and so now, I wrote his obituary. He, he, he lived till 1991, 50 years. Of course, he and the nurse, Becky, went on a date, and of course they married. And of course they lived happily for 50 years. He passed and she remained a, an ardent supporter of Pearl Harbor survivors. And again and again, she would tell that story and she's still at it. I, I, I heard her tell it at a, at a college on the East Bay, I think two years ago. She tells that story and then she reaches into her purse and she pulls out that bullet. I think it's one of the most amazing Amazing stories right here in, in you know in our area. Um, you know, I mentioned that I'd, I'd written some some big stories, and one of them I was the I wrote our first story, the Press Democrats' first story about Nicholas Green of Bodega Bay. Anybody remember Nicholas Green? Well, he was. We heard from Bodega Bay about what happened to him. It was, in 19, it was October of 1994, and I was working, I think it was probably a Saturday night, and I heard what happened to, to Nicholas Green. And I wrote the story. I wasn't able to contact the Greens. Um, there was, they were a remarkably wonderful family. Reg Green, Maggie Green, and their, their two children, they went to, they were, he was British. And they were world travelers and they were in southern Italy and they were driving late one night on a highway in southern Italy. And a car came up alongside, like he wanted to pass, and he fell back. And then the, the, the two guys in this car were shouting. And here, here's the, a man and his wife, Americans, and they had two little sleeping kids in the back. And they don't know what these people want, but they know they're not pulling over. And suddenly there's a bang. And Either the rear window or the side window it explodes, the gunshot, and 
Reg Green, a wonderful man, he's a journalist. Reg Green was a financial journalist in, in England and he's continued doing that over here. He accelerated, he's gonna to try to get away. You know, it's one of these judgment calls, but he's not gonna pull over. He's not gonna pull over and subject his family to whoever these guys are and whatever it is they want. Fortunately, they get away. And the, the kids had been sleeping in the back. And Reg, uh, when he stopped, he opened the door, the dome light, dome light came on, and he saw that Nicholas appeared to still be sleeping but his tongue was slightly out of his mouth and he had a little vomit on his chin. And, and, and an examination shows that he'd been struck in the head uh, by a bullet. So they, uh, they made the uh, anguish decision um, that when he was unplugged, they donated his organs to seven Italians, most of them young, and bestowed new life on these seven people. And um, it truly changed the world. Italy, as a Catholic country, was not into donation, organ donation. And, and I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not putting down Catholic, it was just part of the culture, that's not what they did. You didn't cut people up. Well, the whole country of Italy mourned, you know, for Nicholas Green. And there was a book, there was a movie, and Reg Green, who's now in his 90s, has lived every day of his life, and I still speak with Reg sometimes. He has committed his life from that day to promoting or organ donation. We all know how many, you know, I can't remember the statistic off the top of my head, but every day people die waiting on these lists for heart, lungs, liver, kidney. And this truly changed the world. And I've enjoyed staying in touch with, with, with Reg Green all these years. Uh, remarkably, if, if Nicholas Green were still alive, Today, he would be 34 years old. And I just, actually, I just visited him last week. Um, I, I try to get all around this county with my Australian Shepherd. And uh, last weekend, we drove out to the cemetery at Bodega. And if, if you're, if, when well, it's a sweet cemetery to walk around, there on the hill, just right past the town of Bodega, before Highway 1. And if you walk up there, you'll find Nicholas Green's um, grave. But that was that was a story that I will never ever forget. Um, and it's been wonderful. Again, by working so long at one place, I've had a chance to kind of follow that story since his death. And you know, they, there's that bell tower out in Bodega Bay with a hundred bells from from people all throughout Italy. And so that the story is still alive. And I, I believe there's probably still an effect, a positive effect on organ donation from, um, from the gift of uh, a little Nicholas Green. Um, there was another story that, that I, I won't dwell on. Uh, well, I'll tell you that I, I wrote our first story about um, polyclass. And I'm not even, it's so, uh, I think most of us know who Polly Class was. But I'll just say that I will never forget, it was a Saturday. I worked a lot of Saturdays. I covered a lot of Rose Parades. Uh, What's that? Polly Class was 80. I want to say, you know, I didn't write, was it 87? Uh, I, I, so I think, think about that. 12 years old, and I'll just, Recall, I was driving. I came up over the Katadi uh, hill, called Katadi grade, and I'm coming down the Katadi grade, and I'm thinking, by the time I get to Petaluma, this thing is going to be sorted out. This thing is going to be sorted out. There was no way that the boogeyman walked in off the street in downtown Petaluma and grabbed this child in front of her two sleepover friends with her mother asleep in the next bedroom. There's no way that happened. 
Um, and then, I promise I won't dwell on this, but I did do our first story on Carmina Salcedo. That, you know, Carmina, after that, unbelievable crime wave. Carmina was gone for a number of years and came back. And I did our first interview with Carmina Salcedo, and I'll always remember that. Because Carmina, of course, was, was two years old, turning three, I think, when this happened. And if you were here, you can remember how <coughs> joyous out of, the, out of that horror when this little girl was found and survived, that Carmina Salcedo survived the murder um, uh, rape of her, of her father. And um, Carmina came back and I interviewed her and here she was, you know, 20 years old and has a scar on her throat. And um, one story that I hoped I would write, I, and I would still come back to the press time I had to, to write it, would be about the survival, the, the true survival of Carmina Salcido. She's had a very, 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 very tough life. And if anybody deserves to be messed up, it's Carmina Salcido. But I was always hoping she would um, lift, her, get, lift herself up out of it. An another story that I did, and I'll wrap up, was, uh, and I, I, how often do you see the, 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 the cross, the white cross on the hill out there at St. Francis. Arvo Canisto's cross. And I met Arvo a number of times, and he was a character. And Arvo was a uh, World War II veteran, and he was a San Francisco police officer, and he was a tough old guy. Arvo Canisto was one tough bird. And he was a Christian, and he said that one time he was flying into uh, Rio de Janeiro, and there's that beautiful statue of Christ looming over the bay. And it came to him that he wanted to build a cross. He wanted to build a cross for, uh, for Jesus Christ and in memory of all of who were lost uh, in World War II. And that guy, when he's 60, 70, 80 years old, First, before I went up there with him, I didn't know what that cross was made of. I don't know what I thought it was made of. But we've all seen it, right? That cross has been there. It's, it's been like 30 years. Rocks. Rocks this big. And this tough little bird, he picked up and lugged those rocks from the hillside. And he did a beautiful job of surveying. I don't even know how he did that. I know it wouldn't look like a cross if I built it, you know. But that thing is straight. <clears throat> Something like 60 feet tall. So he lugs those rocks. Actually, he built a smaller one. And he stood back. We drove across town and thought, well, it looks good, but bigger would be better. <laughs> and he did get the permission of the landowner to put that cross on that hill. And it's steep. And so he built it, and then he would go up from time to time with uh, Roundup. <laughs> Didn't make him real popular with the neighbors down the hill. Mm -hmm. And he'd spray it, only whitewashed it. That's why it stood out there. Those, those, those rocks were whitewashed. And he'd go up there and douse it with uh, weed killer. And he was very proud of it. Um, the, Kids would go up sometime and get their jollies by rolling some of his rocks back down the hill. And that guy would go, Arvo would walk back up there, pick up those rocks and return them to that cross. So he's very, very devoted to it and very proud of it. And what I remember most of that story, the first time I wrote it, and, the, and again, I'll just say, by being here so long, I was able to write about Arvo and his cross over a number of years. Anything that would happen, you know, good or bad, ultimately I wrote Arvo's obituary and I attended his service. But um, kids would roll him down, he'd go and he'd, he'd take them back up. Um, ultimately, uh, it was a sad day for Arvo that, his, that the landlord had to tell him Arvo you can't go up there anymore because actually I do believe that the, the arrangements, the, the, the um, agreement between Arvo and the landlord 
was one person, one person can trespass on this land to go up and deal with this cross. And that one person is you, Auro Canisto. Clearly, you own that hill like that. You do not want people trucking up and down there, messing with these rocks, and then they're going to sue you when they fall and break their neck. Well, Arvo, he's funny, like, um, I know that when I was there the first time, he said, come on up. And he, I know when our photographer went out there, he says, come on up. And they take the Boy Scouts up there, and I think that he kind of forgot <coughs> that he really wasn't supposed to have anybody up there. But what was interesting about that street, you know, if you go up to Skyhawk, I, actually, I was just up there this morning, as a matter of fact, there's a street on, on, on Skyhawk that the houses are facing north, and it kind of, and there's the, there's that cross right there. And of course, we all know we can see it from everywhere. You can see it from Spring Lake. You can... Actually, one time when I was writing about Arvo Canisto's cross, <clears throat> I think somebody told me that sure enough, if, at the Santa Rosa Plaza, <clears throat> if you go into the food court and they've got that arched window, you look straight up 4th Street and there's Arvo Canisto's cross. And what was interesting, I'm knocking on doors and asking them, because it, it was controversial. Hey, what do you think of that cross? And there, the gamut, the range of opinion was really interesting. I spoke with Christians who loved it. I spoke with Christians that even though it's their faith and it's, that's the symbol of their faith, they didn't think it was right to impose that on others. Or, they're just more environmentalist type, you know, and I don't want a cross or I don't want anything scarring that natural Sonoma County Hill, so no. And on the other side, same thing. I, I talk to people who um, do not appreciate the cross and they detest it, and others who said, well, I'm not, I'm not a Christian myself, but that, that cross to me is just part of Sonoma County, you know? And it's, uh, it's a landmark, you can see it from the moon kind of thing. So I bet Arvo was another guy who I, um, I enjoyed talking to year after year. And he was a kind of a crusty old guy. And I was there and he practically in tears <clears throat> when he was told he couldn't do it again. But that cross is still there. And that cross will always be there <clears throat> in some fashion. I think the last time I wrote about it was after the fire. And now I kind of forget, I think it was the 20s, I think it was the Tubbs fire. But anyway, it blackened that hillside. Mm -hmm. And prior to the blackening that hillside, the cross was kind of um, obscured. But now, with the grass all black and cut back, that cross just went boom, you know, mm -hmm. boom. So I would just say, these, um, these are just a few of the stories. I, I, I think I'm kind of give me a flavor that these are the kind of stories that truly made my career. You know, it was stories that the people of Sonoma County might talk about, stories that help readers of the Press Democrat feel like they're part of the community. And, and, they're, and they're not, by and large, harmful stories. I will close by saying that I had this theory that came to me. And I, I worked for that newspaper for a long time, and you will, uh, I think, agree with me that if somebody gets up in Sacramento tomorrow, uh, or set Saturday morning, on their Harley Davidson, and they drive that, they ride that Harley Davidson to Sonoma County, why wouldn't you? And we hope you have a nice ride, and I don't mean to be flippant, but let's say that you are on your Harley Davidson, you come here and you're going down the Russian River, and you don't know the area, and you turn wide and you go into a tree, and you're killed. That story will appear in the Press Democrat. And I don't, I think probably most newspapers our size and smaller, like motorcycle accidents are not going to make the New York Times. But the Press Democrat, if you ride that, your motorcycle over here and you are killed on that, you, that will be in the Press Democrat. And I look, and came to, because I wrote them myself a number of times, but then I have to think of what, what, what good, why do I need to know that? I don't know this guy. I'm sorry that he died. I am, I am sorry that he died, but I don't know him. What am I supposed to do with this information? How am I supposed to feel about this 
this story that this guy died on his Harley Davidson in Grenville. How, why, why is that news? Alternately, I came to believe very fervently that if in, instead that guy had come over here and he had seen an uh, injured fawn on the side of the road and he had stopped and he had gotten that fawn to the rescue center in Kenwood, or if he had stopped for lunch in Monterio and for some reason felt moved to buy lunch for the people at the next table, that might not appear in the press Democrat, but it would under my watch because that's a sweet story and that's a story that you can, you might, well, maybe I could do that sometime. Maybe I could buy the next people lunch. Or isn't that nice that he would stop? And you, I feel like that is a story that I could do something with. And so I came around to, I'm done personally writing about death and destruction, the board of life. And that's, that's where I prefer to focus my attention. So with that, um, do you have any, oh, any questions? Or did I did did I mention the, the you know the press Democrat is is closing their printing press right and that's oh, yeah. that's a sad thing but yes I was wondering what that's going to do if you know to deadlines earlier like an hour or well two? you know all I know is what I read in the press Democrat right. <laughs> and it said a little earlier. I have a doubt, I doubt myself that it's gonna be a little earlier. I have a hunch that the deadlines are gonna be substantially earlier because now we're being printed come March or April all the way over in Fremont and those papers have to be trucked here. And you know, I can tell you that, you know, over the years they were always coming, we gotta get this stuff in early, we always, and they do. The way that a newsroom works is you never wanna be a copy editor or an editor because any reporter, you know, most of us in our jobs wait till the last minute to finish anything, right? And I always did. And so, to say if you're you're an editor or a copy editor waiting to edit these stories and ready, waiting to be able to put these stories on a page. Say if the deadline's five o'clock or five thirty. Eight eight reporters all wait till the the last minute and give you this barrage of copy, but no, God, no, please, 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 they're always begging us, and I would too, please, get it to me at 4.30, get it to me at four, don't turn all your stuff in at six o'clock, you're killing us. Um, so they're always trying to move up the, the, uh, the deadline, but I would be surprised if it's not an hour earlier, and that, you know, it just has an effect, and then we'll see, you know, I do think uh, it does seem like it's fairly inevitable that one day the print newspaper will go away. And uh, I do not look forward to that day. Um, let's hope, as we were talking at our table today, the New York Times and the Washington Post and um, a few other papers, I'm not sure how the uh, Wall Street Journal is doing, but are doing fabulously with training people to read their newspaper online. And uh, who could argue with it? How ancient is it? And what, how environmentally inconsiderate to print newspapers on, from dead trees and then spend, uh, burn how many gallons of fuel every day distributing that newspaper. It's horrible. And yet, I love picking up that newspaper in the morning. Yes? Um, I have a solution. <laughs> Good. It never worked. I love to read USA Today. Four sections, they're always the same. Right. The little factoids in the corner, and I get most of my news there. And I, I love to read the newspaper. I read the PD every day. Right. I've already read today. Uh, but it's all the same news. No matter yep. what paper you pick up, a lot of it is the AP. Yep. And, yes, and, it uh, is. Uh, so my thought would be to, this is totally impractical. But to negotiate with uh, Gannett or whoever owns the uh, USA Today now, and uh, come up with a fifth section of local news, so that the, the PD could continue to do the really meaningful stuff that's, that's related to Sonoma County, and uh, problem is. solved. But it wouldn't work because they're two different organizations and the coordination. So my other idea, or my other comment is, 
being a veteran myself, I yes. know a lot of other guys in here with a lot of similar experiences. I think it's really ironic that uh, I remember vividly being in a hole someplace over in Vietnam and all hell breaking loose and everything, and thinking, this is just like the movies. You know, the, the, it, it, and that thought really came into yeah. my head. And, uh, you know, about how realistic the movies are. All oh, right. could yeah. stand to watch them now. Since Private Ryan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they don't amazing. spare you anything now. Yeah, and there's so many good stories. I mean, every time I think back about, oh, yeah, you know, some of the weirdest, most ironic, uh, coincidental things happen. That's my story. Interesting. Uh, well, I appreciate that. And, you know, as an approach to what you're saying about, say, the, the wire news, the press Democrat has in, in the past been confronted with the question, rather than trying to cover the world, because the press Democrat does try to be a, a comprehensive newspaper, right? It's not like, you know, we know the, the little dailies, I love them, and they're, I mean, the little weeklies, and they're all struggling, but the Sebastopol paper covers all. Only Sebastopol, Pendleton, only you know Cloverdale, blah blah blah. The Press Democrat tries tries to cover not only Sonoma County, but a little bit of Lake, little Mendocino, and then cover the world, the national and international. Why doesn't the Press Democrat just cut back and print just the local news? And I think it's probably a conversation worth having. I mean, we like being more comprehensive, but as you know, yes. By the time you pick up the Press Democrat, you probably know what happened with the Bullion Riot Rights Act. You probably, I, I, I had to laugh even myself, and you pick up the Press Democrat the day after the 49ers game last week, you know. And it's like, hey, did you hear? The 49ers won. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I did hear. But to this point, the Press Democrat is trying to, to, to continue to be more con um, comprehensive and regional. I yes. Guess I just want to 